hate speech. It's a very serious crime in South Africa now, by the way, with our new democracy, which was created with our first democratic election in 1994. Um, but I immediately went to the board that deals with these things, and I gave them the recording of my speech and other writing, and they did a very serious study of what I said, and they found in my favor. So it was a very useful way, and remains a useful way of dealing with Zionism. I've often wondered what the best comparison should be, because indeed, they do behave like Nazis in the measures that they meet out. The time doesn't allow me to go through the lists, house demolitions, torture, and, and so on, the kind of checkpoints, etc., um, akin to what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto of 1943 in Poland. But we have found that the most apt way to describe what is happening in the occupied territories, but actually also within the belly of the beast, within Israel itself to Palestinian people, and any minority who are not Jewish is akin to apartheid. And what you find from the Zionists throughout the world to Israel itself that this hits them very hard. They get incredibly angry and defensive. And I think that it shows how close to the truth we are. A South African already in 1961, imagine how long ago, in 1961, said, that Israel is an apartheid state. And I like to test my audience. And I do say, if there's any journalist here, that um, I forbid them to answer the, the quiz. I ask the audience who they think might have said in 1961 that Israel is an apartheid state. So is there anyone bold enough to try to guess well, are you putting your hand up or just wiping your head like this? Both, um, Berber, how do you say it? Sorry? Berber? Berber, yeah. yes, but you've obviously heard that somewhere. Oh. <laughs> because people are usually looking yeah. for Nelson Mandela or Joe Slovo or, you know, the great people in Australia. It was actually the architect of apartheid, a man who studied psychology, philosophy, that is masters and his doctorates in Germany from the early 30s and so on into the 30s, Dr. Hendrik Verwoerd, who became the architect of apartheid. Now we had a racist colonial state in South Africa from the middle of the 17th century. 1652 is when the Dutch came and started establishing the colony. A couple of centuries later, the British came, pushed them out, took over. You know about the discovery of diamonds and gold, a very wealthy country, the enslavement of black people uh, for the purpose of, of tremendous exploitation of labor and the racism, the colonialism that you would find anywhere under the Belgian, the French, the British uh, in, in the world. But it was from 18, uh, 1948 that the most extreme racists of South Africa declared the apartheid project and turned South Africa into a much more vicious, racist, settler, colonial state of, of an extreme kind. Um, you'd be interested to see coincidence here, perhaps, that, um, as we know, Israel was established in the middle of May, it changes because that was according to the Jewish calendar, but in the, in the Caesarean or Georgian calendar, it's um, 15th of uh, May. And just two weeks later, the party of Verbot ousted the more
more moderate racist party of General Smuts and imposed apartheid. They came into being the same time. Um, and they then began to pass the laws, the racist laws. So they legislated this, and of course behind those laws were very harsh measures of apartheid. And they began to separate people more and more. House demolition, uh, the movement of black people out of town so that they <coughs> simply became white and the blacks were placed in uh, ghettos elsewhere, etc. There was resistance, so more extreme reaction, and so on. The process went. By 1961, when Fabuk declared Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state, he was furious with uh, the British particularly, but uh, the West generally, led <coughs> by Britain, um, who after Sharpeville were getting rather anxious as to what might happen to this very important country with all this mineral wealth under the hands of apartheid and felt that the system shouldn't be too harsh. Um, he complained. Why are you complaining about us Afrikaners here in Southern Africa? You are always extolling the virtues of this new Jewish state called Israel, and you condemn us. And he was reminding them of the fact that Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. He got a lot of his facts wrong in terms of the visions and the, the mindset of this man, and you'll recognize it in what he said to follow. He said the Jews have taken the land that the Arabs had for 12, 1300 years. So for him, uh, the land of Palestine was really Palestine, not from time immemorial, from the time of the, the rise of Islam. Um, but he understood very well that the process of the dispossession of the land from indigenous people and the stripping of their rights of national determination, of human rights, was absolutely akin to what had happened in South Africa as a colonial settler state, as we had seen in the Amer North America in Australia, New Zealand, the indigenous people there were virtually ethnically cleansed. There was genocide there, of course. Um, the colonial settlements took effect. And in South Africa, of course, the black tribal kingdoms were too powerful to be exterminated, but they were dispossessed and stripped of rights, as he could see was the case with the Palestinians. And we always say that if we are to understand the struggle of the Palestinian people, and we need to fight for this truth all the time, and perhaps in a country like Lebanon and throughout the Maghreb and the Middle East for obvious reasons, people understand it. But this is an international battle it's a battle with the United Nations. It's a battle particularly in Western countries and where Israel, since 1948 and even before, has received so much support, and especially more and more from the United States. You know the billions every year in terms of military aid, three billion from 48 on per average, plus another two to three billion every year in investments and so on, uh, that, that this has helped to build Israel. And that the struggle then for rights for the Palestinians and against Zionism means that we must put before the people of the world this reality of Israel being 
a colonial settler state, a racist state, and this kinship with apartheid. There was a time, even with the United Nations, when it was a more progressive body as we see at this present time. Uh, during the 60s with the decolonization movement, and particularly Africa, and the emergence of the African states, and throughout the 80s, where actually at the United Nations resolution was passed, and that resolution of 1974 it was, compared the apartheid South Africa and, and Israel apartheid, and declared them criminal, and still on the Rome Statutes of 2002, uh, any country practicing apartheid system is declared criminal. Now with America's aid and the aid of, of the European Union and uh, of the media in the West, Israel is whitewashed and is given absolute immunity and there's this complicity in Israel's enormous crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and so on. And therefore the battle to deal with Israel is to absolutely expose its practices. And I want to repeat that it's not simply the horrendous situation before the naked eye that we see on our television screens every week of what's happening in besieged Gaza and on the West Bank, but the much more subtle and camouflaged situation of Palestinians within Israel itself. And this is also becoming more and more exposed and is very important for us to, to see and to understand. There's um, aspects of this that are so clear to the witness that I want you to know that from South Africa, when we visit, firstly, the occupied territories, so Gaza and the West Bank, any South African who has been involved in our liberation struggle immediately is so shocked at what we see that we find that we're going down the nightmare into our past with the French called déjà vu. And we believe that we're seeing what our people went through. The experience before us of these military and the security forces and the way they treat people, the checkpoints, the roadblocks, the humiliation, the indignity, uh, not to mention the house demolitions and then of course the wholesale assaults and bombardments. But everybody who goes there says, my God, this is worse than anything we experienced under apartheid because it is so severe and savage. In, 19, in 2004, I visited uh, Ramallah with the South African delegation and the late President Yasser Arafat is still alive. And we had visited around the ruins, the smashed areas, and then he remarkably gave us a fantastic Palestinian Lebanese style lunch. It was unbelievable what was put on the table, just like today's lunch in one of the lovely cafes of, of your city. It was unbelievable that they could do that, the kindness, and so on. And that old man with the big staring eyes said to us, well, you South Africans have come here, just look at this Bantu star. And I said, no, Comrade President, it's not a bad stone. Now the Palestinians, there was silence, and he was looking at me, what was this man trying to say? And I let the silence last a bit, and I then explained, and I said, uh, Comrade President, you see, a 
banter storm. Never in South Africa, and we had several banter storms, never were they surrounded with walls or even barbed wire. When you travel from South Africa, the road system, beautiful, high grade, first world standard, you knew you were coming to a banter storm because the road started getting potholes and it turned into gravel. And you know, you saw that the surrounding area was not very attractive and built up, but you didn't know you had driven in. Only when there were times of tension did the police from South Africa, the Bantustan police, stand at the border and check your car. We would drive in, and in the capital of the Bantustan, small little Mickey Mouse capital, to be sure, they had grand palaces for the presidents of the Bantustan. They had beautiful buildings for the parliaments of the Mickey Mouse states as a facade. And they had this little elite there, of course, who were very wealthy with lovely houses. I said, Mr. President, they had their own airline and airport. And they could get into that air air aircraft and fly outside South Africa as they wished. His eyes grew bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and I said, and you know, President Arafat, never ever in their history were aeroplanes dropping bombs on the towns of the Bantu Star, or tanks rolling in and firing missiles. There were some tensions at times, and some strikes or protests, which the police could clear, clear up quite easily, of course, but nothing on that, that status, that standard. So, very clearly, the measures that apartheid adopted were terrible. And in the townships of our country, we had times where the, the townships outside Johannesburg, you heard of Soweto, or any of the big cities, the people were protesting, there were clashes, people were being shot down. You heard about Sharpeville in 1960. 69 people were mown down, 250 wounded in a single demonstration. These things were horrendous crimes of apartheid, as were the unseen, invisible violence of apartheid, which meant that the infant mortality rate amongst blacks was almost 200 per 100,000. Amongst whites, it was about 15, 16 per 200 per 100,000. The life expectancy of whites was in the upper 70s, of blacks it was 45, 46. You know, the pension that had been paid out was four times, five times greater for a white than a black pensioner, etc. The, the, the uh, wage scales were hugely different. The enormous disparities of education and such like. Now, we don't have the time to examine all the laws of Israeli Zionism. There are 34 laws which are clearly discriminatory racist laws about where people can live, the question of who gets the pensions um, and, and the better treatment, the municipal race factors, how you can build, where you can build, uh, who you can marry, and so on. But of course, the overriding proof of Israel being an apartheid state is that it's only if you are Jewish that you have full rights. And if you are not, you are second class citizen. It's very straightforward. And the, in Hebrew, I think the word hasbara, which is the segregation of the people. So it exists there in a very deep rooted way. We've recently had a tribunal in South Africa called the Russell Tribunal. And this tribunal is in the name of the great British philosopher and peace activist against nuclear disarmament and then the Vietnam War of the 60s, Bertrand Russell, um, who had a tribunal against American war crimes in Vietnam. And now from Europe, from Belgium actually, there's the tribunal against the Palestine and Israeli crime. We, I, I happen to be a juror 
omnibus tribunal. And in 2010, we had two hearings, one in March in Barcelona and the second in London in November, and then this last month in Cape Town, South Africa. The Zionists in all these countries and Israel ignored the two tribunals of Barcelona and London. When it came to South Africa, they went crazy. They had their own Zionist lobby who were fulminating <coughs> against us and attacking us all. And uh, internationally, they were attacking us. And from the Israeli parliament, they were threatening the uh, Palestinians from Israel who were attending and threatening the uh, members of the Knesset, the parliament, who were giving evidence that they would kick them out of the parliament. Um, Hani Zayavi uh, was, was a wonderful, strong woman who gave evidence. And it showed that they cannot tolerate, they cannot accept this comparison with apartheid because apartheid stands these days for such a immor immoral uh, identification that it hits them to the very core. And the tribunal's findings were precisely, and very great learned minds, including legal minds, examining the system and the UN resolutions had no doubt about Israel practicing the crime of apartheid. I'm wanting to switch quickly to just another aspect of what I want to present, but to say to you all, that we mustn't underrate or undervalue this communication, this educational, call it propagandist if you like, but in a good sense. I'm not saying all propaganda is bad, you see, although the word propaganda sounds that way. But the value of communicating what Zionism is and what Israel is, is extremely important in the solidarity struggle and the mobilization because it helps us to do what was achieved in the struggle against apartheid, where the worldwide anti-apartheid movement helped to isolate the racist regime and supported the struggling people of South Africa, which is what I want to turn to in just uh, perhaps 10 minutes so that we can have hopefully 20 minutes to half an hour to have questions and, and, and some interaction. Just excuse me, I want to soothe the voice a little bit. So what I'm turning to now is something which we discuss with our Palestinian comrades very often. Uh, and not only them, there have been people in Ireland, for instance, in uh, Sri Lanka, um, in the Basque country in Spain, people like the Polisario of Morocco, who are still struggling for rights. And um, they're very interested. How is it that such a once powerful system as apartheid, which could put into the field almost a million soldiers, whites, citizens, there are five million whites in South Africa who had the monopoly of weapons and of skills and technology. Black people under apartheid uh, were forbidden to even have a pistol. And if anybody had such a weapon, they were immediately dealt with, and you didn't see that. Um, anybody who spoke out would be arrested, beaten and would, would face trial and go to prison and so on. Uh, apartheid had huge support from the West because it was good business, good trade and so on. And those of us here who are older, I, I think it's quite a youthful audience, everybody included, but um, people who perhaps so in their 20s wouldn't realize if you were around in the 60s, the 70s, there was this huge oppressive Nazi-like system and people felt, will the blacks of South Africa ever manage to re remove their oppressor? They felt no. And secondly, because the divisions of white and black were so intense, and people thought that race hatred 
that you would just have a bloody civil war at the, at the end. And of course this didn't happen. We, we in fact in the end had a very peaceful negotiated transition. And that's not because <coughs> Nelson Mandela is a magician. It was because he was representing forces and currents of history. But very simply put, let me say this, that like the Palestinians, and I have encountered Palestinians from the 60s, late 60s, already in training. I had my military training in the Soviet Union who gave huge support and material of war and training to people from all over the world who were fighting against uh, colonialism, Palestinians included, people from Latin America, people from Angola and Mozambique. And I was there as, as a very young person. I'm sure you would agree, you must have been very young in that period. Um, and we made very close study of struggles everywhere from Cyprus as a very huge, incredible struggle against colonial, the Kenyan people, the so on, the Algerian people, Vietnamese people, the Cubans, and so on, and the Fidel Castro. And we were very taken with the struggle of the Vietnamese, because in South Africa, represented a David and Goliath struggle, in Vietnam even more so. And since I'm using the Old Testament as the, the book of the Jews, the Old Testament, and using David and Goliath, I want to immediately tell you that as far as I'm concerned, and I've written a pamphlet, David and Goliath, who is who in the Middle East, that David is the Palestinians against the Goliath, which is the Zionist Israel. Um, but we studied this Vietnam situation, and we went there, we learned from that. And there's an outstanding Vietnamese leader who happens to still be alive, age 97, called General Vo and Guyan Jap, G-I-A-P. He's worth checking on, he's worth reading. I think he's one with Ho Chi Minh of the most outstanding people of the 20th century. This man, who was a history teacher, by the way, was made a, a general in charge of military forces by Ho Chi Minh, who recognized in him certain abilities. And in 1954, he is the man who defeated the French at a place called Dien Bien Phu in, in Vietnam. He is the same man who led them in the struggle against the American Goliath and defeated them. And they put it very well, Jacques. And he said, during the course of the struggle, he said, we will be victorious for the following reasons. We ask is a just struggle, which gives us the moral superiority over the enemy. But with a just struggle, you need to have a correct theory and a strategy of struggle, and a leadership who understands this. You need to have a united and a determined people and he identified international support. They had huge support from all over the world. And what was decisive was the support they were getting from ordinary people in America. And some of you might remember Kent University, where students, American students, protesting for the Vietnamese were shot down, six of them were killed in one day on the campus. And he said, in terms of methods of struggle, which can vary, and it's up to people of any struggle to decide, um, that we, the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese, have a weapon that is more stronger than nuclear weapon. And he put it, the invincible art of people's war. So it's actually not just guerrilla war. And this is what we learned to our great uh, prophet, that it's not just armed people and guerrillas in the terrain, but a people's war, which you understand it as the science of various methods of struggle and how you use political and military according to your terrain and so on and your conditions. We 
had been fighting and using armed method of strong for some time, and we had been making a lot of mistakes, and we were failing to turn it into a people's war, where people, everybody, has their role in an intifada. It can be peaceful, it can be revolutionary forms of violence, it can be strikes and boycotts and the like. Um, and as I emphasize always, and we do so as South Africans, we can't prescribe for people, they, they, they need to develop these things themselves. Some people might find that methods of non-violence are what they prefer. We did that for 50, 60 years in South Africa, by the way. And then came to a point, it was a sharp of the brutality of the regime, which made it impossible for us to, to, to further the struggle by peaceful means. That's when we adopted our armed struggle. But we don't, in South Africa, have the... We've got mountains, we've got a beautiful, large country, and it's very varied, and it's from subtropics to Mediterranean-style climate, like here. But we don't have uh, forests and jungles. So, in terms of our armed struggle, it was at a rather low level of guerrilla-style operations and the use of sabotage, reinforcing mass struggle of the people, which we said was the main method, which in the end proved right in the 80s, and millions of our people were involved in, in uprising. And that came to unban the ANC and the release of Mandela and forced the regime into negotiations with us having strength on our side. You never negotiate from weakness. If you do, what will happen to you is you get nowhere, which I would say is, is what's happened with Oslo and these last 20 years, you see. And this is why we need to learn from the soil and the experience of our own struggle, but also from the experience of other people in history. And in this way, a just cause will succeed. So we boil down our experience, and I'm going to end with this, into what we call the four pillars of the South African struggle. And these four pillars for us were firstly and most important, we call it political mobilization of our people. And we said the political aspect of their education, consciousness, inspiring them, their, um, the direction of, the, of their energy in various forms marches, demonstrations, protests, strikes, and so on, civil disorder, intifada, and so on, was the one major element, and the demography would work in our favor. And we said that the second pillar would be our armed actions. And we saw this in our situation, unlike the Vietnamese, because they had a free border with North Vietnam, they had the Soviet Union, which would give them the, the missiles, the rockets, etc., to deal with the Americans. Uh, and they had the forests and jungles. That method, that aspect of struggle, with, for them became the paramount one. For us, we saw the need to use the methods of struggle, sabotage, cutting the communications, destroying the electric pylons, attacking the military and police where we could, using guerrilla activities that way. What it did in our situation was a very important factor, psychological. Even if it was a small action and a small blow in which the guerrilla survived, our people saw it as a great victory like did we do. Because this is black people who aren't allowed to have guns, and they see a black person or a group of black who ambush a small group of white police and killed three or four, it was like a major battle, and it would inflame the people. Or if a police station had a rocket fired at it and one policeman was injured, the black population around there behaved as though the Intifada was victorious, you see. It has a huge psychological impact, which is a very important factor of struggle. So it was very inspirational. The third element was an underground structure underground network, like I'm sure you've all read about the heroic resistance against the Nazis of Europe, the French resistance, and the Dutch resistance, and so on. 
um, a resistance can't survive unless you have many, many sympathizers who are doing things, providing you with safe houses, driving you around, helping to smuggle material, printing leaflets, painting slogans and the like in a sy systematic manner, in a sustainable manner, which that itself, when oppressed people just see a slogan on the wall, and it's going to take the authorities a few hours to brush it out, people will hear that was there. The people are victorious, down with the regime. And we kept doing this all around South Africa. So the underground also provided us with the ability to, to have people trained outside, to send in weapons, and for them to find a safe refuge where we couldn't have a refuge in forest in the mountains. They could have safe houses where they could lie up and, 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 be, and, and have sanctuary. And then, as with the Vietnamese, our fourth pillar, which in the South African case proved incredibly, incredibly valuable and important. And we would say it took the balance our way. It was the might of the worldwide anti-apartheid movement, which over 30 years isolated apartheid. It involved boycott. It involved um, divestment and sanctions. In the end, even their military couldn't get sufficient modern weaponry. So by the way, just like Israel, they were exporting violence into neighboring states. They were attacking all the neighboring states who were helping us, helping us in the way the Arab states should be helping the Palestinians, by the way. And these African states were far, far poorer, far from being wealthy that they were prepared to sacrifice. And there was a major war in Angola. And when it came to the major battle, uh, at battles at the end of the 80s, 1987, 88, when the Cubans were helping the Angolans, the South African Mirage jets, which were actually the Israeli kafir, because by this time, Israel and apartheid South Africa were in an axis from 1973, when after the October War, apartheid South Africa came to Israel's assistance. So they developed very strong links, and especially in the military area, uh, to break the sanctions. But the Israeli military machinery was not up to the purpose. And the South Africans who were having to, to deal with them for warships, for aircraft, and the like. They were second to what the Soviet Cuban weapons were. And the Cuban pilots with Angolan pilots came to dominate the air around the battlefields of Namibia and Angola. That's what then led to South Africa giving up the Namibian occupation, coming back into South Africa, and then with the force of our people and this massive worldwide support, they were now forced into real negotiation, leading to Mandela's release of the Senate, et cetera, et cetera, and us winning through. And that's why the result in the end was relatively peaceful. And we could pass over into a situation where we have a South Africa now not without problems and difficulties and aspects of race, prejudice, etc., but a country which is growing and developing and where, in fact, the racism that you have, where whites refuse to have anything to do with blacks, now every white person wants to have a black friend, every white businessman wants to have black faces on their board, they realize that it's a, a wonderful country, they can make prosperity, but they have to learn that they are Africans, just like the Jews in historic Palestine need to be reminded and to learn to live as people of the Middle East, as Arabs, which is what they have been originally. And I know from, as, as a Jew, and I know from my ancestry, if you saw my mother and my father, you wouldn't be able to tell any difference. My 
mother looks like and looked like in her day the most beautiful Lebanese or Palestinian woman. If I showed you her picture. And the two are indistinguishable, actually. When they came, we had uh, the Israeli, Palestinian or Jews coming to Cape Town, people couldn't tell who was Jewish, who was Arab. You know that as well, I'm sure. But uh, I come with this presentation. I'm here uh, with Rabea um, over here, Abusha, for the United Nations. We're speaking tomorrow on the United Nations Day. They have a very special day. i uh, end on this point. We want to see the United Nations resuming its better stance at the time when the African, Asian people, the Middle Eastern people, were much stronger in the United Nations in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Today, there's too much power in the, the hands of reaction, which is why the United Nations gets used for the wrong purposes. But it's a battlefield there too, and we must do everything to strive to ensure that the resolutions, the hundred plus resolutions for the Palestinian struggle are implemented and that that situation changes. And therefore my final point is our belief, and we say this to the Palestinians, they are not alone. Those human beings who ascribe to justice in this world stand with them. And what we do know like a marathon race, in the end they will work and justice will prevail. But it will come through their struggle, their support, uh, their persistence and determination with the help of the rest of humanity. So thanks for your patience. And um, I'm ready with the chair helping me here to select the hands and the people who have questions. I, I, I do have an event that I have to go to, I think 20 minutes. Thank you very much. since the Ramallah is very clearly in the Kimo state today. Um, and, uh, and all of those things you talked about, the palaces and the wealth of uh, the elite few uh, who've made millions of, or billions of dollars off of Oslo and, uh, and essentially passing the, uh, the, the ghettos of the West Bank off as an independent state at some point um, is, is in the works. So I just wonder, in the case of South Africa, the struggle against the Mickey Mouse, uh, the Mick, you know, the Donald Ducks of the, <laughs> yeah, uh, of the Van Vistan government. Um, uh, how, you know, when it's blacks against blacks, or Palestinians against Palestinians in this case, uh, it's a slippery slope to civil war when uh, they're the ones with the legitimate use of arms, when they're the ones with, uh, uh, 
you know, I mean, in our case right now, they also are the ones with all of the international legitimacy. So, for example, uh, even the ANC government, that's the party that they deal with, right? When you were a member of that government, you had to say things like, I support the two-state solution, even though it's, uh, non it's rubbish. So, um, so I wonder, in the case of Palestinians, and also that, that Mickey Mouse government extends beyond the borders of the West, to other places where Palestinians live, um, and those interests extend as well. Uh, so how did the South African anti-apartheid resistance um, think or strategize and work against We visit uh, lately to South Africa. I was uh, <clears throat> happily uh, uh, reminded of the struggle by young people in South Africa uh, uh, for Palestine. And um, I met students uh, from Johannesburg who are very active on the BDS. So if you could please remind us of some of the struggles in South Africa uh, uh, supporting the Palestinians against um, the ties that the South African government has now with uh, Israel. Okay, thanks. Uh, those are three extremely interesting questions. Thanks very much. Um, to take the question first, necessary to give it a great deal of thought because you're correct and you touch on the fact of a major difference between South African apartheid and Israeli apartheid and that is that in the South African model they needed black labor they wanted black labor so they wanted slaves and when you need slaves you want to keep them alive for the purpose of their labor, their labor power. Um, with the Palestinian case, they've actually gone to the most extreme point that apartheid under Dr. Fagut proposed. Fagut actually proposed that white South Africa should get to a point where it didn't need black labor. And that was an impossibility in South Africa, given its vastness, and the numbers, the demography. So, you know, the white business used to laugh at him. And uh, you, you had examples of these very fierce apartheid families like his, refusing to even um, employ a black person to clean their house or look after their garden. We've got a little oasis of South Africa called Aranya, which is run like a farm, but it's, it's, it's a larger area, by his, his um, son-in-law. Uh, they don't break the law, but it's just a place where the whites do all the labor, so they're trying to show it's possible. Um, and this basically meant in South Africa, as you pointed out, that with boycott there could be huge pressures put as you, as you made the point in the end, business abroad, if you gave the example of the Americans, it applied to the others as well. They wanted to see reforms in the system because uh, of, of the way apartheid was affecting and creating contradictions and so on. Um, however, I think the point you were getting at was that the Palestinians shouldn't have too much faith, you put it, in this process of, of boycott and the role it could 